Welcome to Masada. We're in Israel and this is Masada. Masada is known as a fortress. This is something that King Herod the Great had built. These were Herod's three party houses, three tours. Hey, so while we're here at Masada, I wanted to go over a few really cool facts about this place. So since it's out in the desert, you might think, how do they get water? Uh, well, it's not by like a steady stream of rain coming in. It's actually from like one huge rain that actually can create a river in this desert and it fills up the aqueducts and the cisterns and it has the capacity for 10 million gallons of water. And the servants would bring over buckets of water out here and they have a bathhouse. And only really one living space down here on this three-tiered hanging northern part of the palace uh, for Herod's party house. Now, uh, in terms of the height between the three palaces uh, for Herod the Great, we have 60 feet between the first going down to the second and only 45 feet going down to the third. And when this eventually was taken over, uh, when the Romans came in, uh, they built a siege ramp, and that siege ramp was 1,400 years or 1400 yards long and uh, in terms of it as a structural force I mean this really is a fortress uh, it has doubled walled uh, protection as you get up near the top and uh, that's what's called case made wall and it was only when the siege ramp they were able to get through when uh, they brought up a battering ram and it, they went back and forth and tried bashing down the stone and they really only got in uh, after the people who were defending this place, which were the Qumran community, the Essenes, this was their final holdout against the Romans. They put down wooden pillars, which unfortunately the Romans lit on fire. Um, and after that went up in flame, they were able to get in. And uh, the Qumrans, the Essenes, they had to decide while well, death or slavery. And they ended up taking their lives. And Josephus Flavius, he ended up writing uh, about this account in the speech that was given. Uh, there, which is just really cool. It's worth worth looking into. Uh, in terms of the time frame, we know in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. This is about 74 AD when that battle had happened. And just with all of the violence and some of the darkness that we look at with it, there's such a contrast between this is my fortress, this is this place of greatness, and the humility of Jesus. Right, when we look at the Sermon on the Mount, he says, blessed are the peacemakers. Oh, the difference between just the war that we see here and the peace that Jesus is providing for us. I mean, th this is a kingdom. Th this is really, I mean, Herod the great king. This is his palace. In the contrast with the kingdom of God, it's an upside down kingdom. It's not one where we're this high up. Right, we're looking 60 feet up and 45 feet down and a siege ramp that's 1,400 year, yards long and got all this aqueducts of trying to store up for ourselves 10 million gallons of water. I mean, that's, that's the kingdom of the earth if you've ever seen it. Right? And we, we think about in our own lives, what does that look like when we store up wealth for ourselves? Right? When we try to balance our checkbooks and bank accounts, and maybe have a 401k or however that looks, trying to pay rent every month or maybe using food stamps, whatever that is, that's our means. That's what we trust in. This is what Herod trusted in. And there's a contrast, again, that upside down kingdom. Man, have you ever really looked at the two most important biblical sites, in my opinion, when Jesus came into this world and when he resurrected from the dead? Both of those places, they are accessible today. They are not on lockdown. You do not have security guards and locked gates and metal detectors. Jesus is accessible. He is still accessible today just like he was then. And he is our humble king. When you go down and you see the place of Jesus' birth, when you see that manger, you physically have to duck down under a door and go down into a cave. Herod, you have to come up here. He has a separating wall between this party house where he spent his time, his entertainment, and everyone else. There was a divide. Jesus, you go to his tomb. Let's take a look at uh, Luke really quick. Just one verse in Luke. I absolutely love this. This is in Luke chapter 24. But Peter rose and ran to Jesus' tomb, stooping and looking in. He had to stoop 
to look into Jesus' tomb. This place where the King of Kings dwelt in his greatest moment of victory. You have to stoop, you have to bow. Because even in that place, he was humbling himself. Even after the point of death, he continues to be our humble king and say, blessed are the peacemakers. And Jesus is our greatest peacemaker, the one who has made peace between us and God. And we have a fortress, a mighty fortress is our God, one that is strong and powerful and defends us against not just sin, death, and the devil, but whatever you are specifically struggling with. If you have a loved one that has just died or is at death's row or terribly sick, if you're struggling with your identity, and you're going, man, I, I don't really know who I am. Or purpose, I, I don't know where I'm going. I don't, I don't know why I'm here. Man, you just turn to the kingdom of God. You turn to this Lord who bows, who is humble, who doesn't wear a crown that elevates himself and all of this gold, but one that wears a crown of thorns. You got a king that bleeds for you, that bows down, that washes our feet, Man, that, that is a king that I want to worship. That is one when the world is going to chaos that I want to turn to. He is my refuge, my rock. When things are uncertain, you have somebody trying to siege areas of your life and you're going, man, I don't know how I'm going to get through this emotionally and spiritually. And my family's just, I'm going through. You just turn back to your rock and the person that this book is writing about. You turn back to Jesus. Man, a mighty fortress is our God. This is a fortress and this is just a picture of what a fortress on earth looks like. Can you imagine what God's kingdom looks like? Not a physical kingdom, but the presence of God and the rule and reign of Jesus's grace in your life, giving you this undeserved gift of peace between you and God. That peace that speaks purpose into your life, that speaks to your identity, to who you are and whose you are because you belong to Jesus. Man, that's, that's a rock that I want to turn to. David mentions in the psalm six times, six times Masada. And he says that he returned to the fortress. It's very likely that David came here. David, who defeated Goliath. David, who messed up but still repented and turned back to God. David who was a part of the Davidic covenant, the bloodline that brought the Messiah into this world and into your life. The God who went from heaven to earth humbly to you. Anything you see at sites like this beneath that black line is going to be original. Everything above it's a reconstruction. Where we were was the delegation center. This is largely administrative. And a quick note about the walls. We mentioned beneath that black line was original. Well, what they could do is chisel it and bring it all the way down to this state. And if you add color to this, then it can become a fresco. But you can also polish it and bring it all the way down to marble. So it looks extremely impressive. And that's how much of this probably looked to impress Herod's guests. So these are some of the bathhouses that were used. Interestingly, in this model that we see of it, you see these mosaics down here in these columned walls in this gathering area. Well, out here, uh, there's actually so many mosaics. These are the original Herodian mosaics, but they just have so many that they're just unguarded, unprotected out here. Now, in terms of their bathhouses, they're structured with a caldarium, a tepidarium, a frigidarium. So they would have a furnace down here, which you can actually see where that would have been over here when fanned in. And under the floor, they have this space where that hot air would be blown in, heat up the water on here, and then as the heat rises, um, the water droplets would come up to the ceiling. And instead of just dripping on them, since this is rounded, it would go off to the side so it wouldn't drip on top of them. And then you have their changing room off on the side. In here, this is an example of some of those original frescoes. These are those rounded ceilings inside of the bathhouse. And that's where the water would go up and drip down the sides. 
We mentioned the coldarium. So the furnace used to be right over here and they would fan the hot air in here. And between these pillars, which held up the floor, that's where that hot air would seep through and it would heat up the water that they put on top of here. So you'd have nice hot bath water as that heated up the floor. And then once that water went up, uh, they would need to get the rest of the hot air out of the room so that this wouldn't heat up too much for the air. And that's what these clay tubes are for that would actually ventilate the hot air out naturally. This is where that furnace was that we were talking about that blew that hot air inside. Since I didn't point it out last time, that was the hotel that we stayed at down there, the youth hostel. And this up here, this is actually the Dead Sea, which wraps all the way around until you see that mountain over there. Yeah, and just to the left over here, we have the cable car, which takes you all the way down. Gonna head down to the Northern Palace. It's gonna have those three hanging uh, palaces up here, uh, those party houses that Herod had. Unlike the mikvah, this is just a private bath and a bath to view at that. Uh, also, Josephus describes this next part as being roofed with a conical roof. Quick note about the pillars. Roman pillars tend to have a little bulge in the middle to show that they are bearing more weight. And these ones that have more floral design, these that bulge out at the top are what are called floral. Corinthian. How does he know this story from Eleazar in his speech? We don't know. And the, they, there are four women, two children that survive right here. And they probably go to Rome and they maybe tell him the story of what's going on. Where were they hiding? They were hiding in a cistern in the far end. So they didn't get killed. Uh, so they get captured and they get taken to Rome. And that's probably where Josephus gets his information about Eleazar having this speech. A lot is better to die. So think about that. These are people who are terrified trying to recreate a speech that Eleazar said. Now, if, if you've read the complete Josephus, not the, the shortened version of it, Josephus, the full version goes like this. He tells you a story, and then he goes for three pages about a speech. And then he'll tell you the story in like a half a page. And then he'll, he'll say, and then they have this speech, and it'll be this like, you know, three-page speech. The full Josephus has all these speeches in it, and it's very long. And so you go, Josephus, where, does it, where do you get this stuff? And so the answer to that is, you got to think about Josephus' motive. He's a Jew who's captured and taken to Rome. So on the one hand, he wants to be good to Vespasian and all the Roman emperors because that's, that's his bread and butter. On the other hand, he doesn't want the Jews to look like idiots. And so he writes this to say, hey, they're noble, but the Romans were great warriors. Right. Follow that? Make everyone happy. Yeah, so he's trying to make everybody happy. So Eleazar has this speech. He goes, it's better to die than to be given to the Romans. And even Romans would go like, well, that's kind of noble. You know? So he, he tried, So even those speeches go, like, we don't know where they come from. But he wasn't here. Right. Okay, these are, this is, gives you an idea of the, of the stucco. Then you got the Herodian. So that they will walk away. And then you got Machiris. On the, other, on the Jordanian side, that's where they took John the Baptist. Right? You have Alexandria, which looks like the Herodian, except it's in Samaria. Right? So you got four out here that we just mentioned, right? Then you have Jericho, which is a palace, beautiful palace, but there's part of it that looks like a fort. So think of those building projects, and these are all kind of going on at the same time. Then you have the huge project up in Jerusalem where you expand the temple platform, rebuild that. You're redoing another city, Sebaste, which was Samaria, and then you rename it Sebaste, which is the name for the Caesars. Greek names. So you got all that going on. And then you do the human, the huge building project at the port city of Caesarea. Oh. So does he just get bored and decide, I'm going to build something else today? Well, he wants to put himself in the Roman Empire. These buildings say, we are, we're, we're with Rome, and we're not some backwater. But think of that, you know, sometimes we think, oh, this poor Palestinian Jesus who doesn't really ever see anything like a suburban area. That's not true. He sees opulent buildings. 
Is there any evidence to the extent to which Herod himself participated in? I mean, did he probably looked at somebody's plans and said, "Yeah, that's good," or "I want this bigger." I mean, so he, you know, everyone says, "Well, he built it." Well, he had people. Yeah. I mean, you got to have your architects and your engineers. right people who know how to do it. Sure. Yeah. Is it just that it was under his? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. How, I mean, it doesn't ever tell us. You know, he was looking at the plans every other day, saying, "No, you can do it." Right. I mean, I wonder because they'd be like, "Ah, this guy's not getting off my case." Yeah. Something, yeah. something, maybe not. He wanted opulence. Yeah. So I could see him coming in and say, "Tell me about this." Yeah. Oh, we should do more frescoes. More. Yeah, yeah, more. Of that. Uh, as you saw in the movie, you know, wooden front to it, which got battered in, and then they gave up hope, and that's when they committed suicide. Actually, not technically suicide. They all killed each other. The only guy that committed suicide was the last guy. And so, technically speaking, rabbinically at the time, suicide was the one that was, was forbidden. Everything else could be forgiven. Um, and so that that's just a, a weird little rabbinic thing. Now, the rabbis decried this. They say suicide or taking the life of your family, even in this case, is not what God would want. So even though you saw in the, in the video Ehud Netzer or whatever his name is, Alon, saying, hey, this is a, kind of a victory Kind of a victory. <laughs> yeah, the answer is not really. Not even within rabbinic Judaism is this okay. What is that? And you don't see religious orthodoxy a lot. It's not a shrine place. More For that reason? Nationalistic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like your Alamo. Yeah, so remember the Alamo. Is, maybe you already pointed this out. What's this little mound here? A natural. A natural. Yeah. Okay, and you're saying this ramp came all the way up to this wall at one point? <laughs> yeah, it was so a little higher, a little bit broader. Yeah, we've yeah. seen that trick. Yeah. 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 It's just 30 foot tall. Seems, seems like we keep hearing this. Yeah. 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 Then on top of it, they had a siege tower. Yeah. And it would have been. They made this ramp. This is where the monks lived. If you look down below, this is where one of those cisterns or aqueducts that we talked about were. And over to the side here, this is where a Byzantine church actually was. Right up there in that building. These are some of the guard benches. And like when we talked about with the stone being a lot smoother, uh, this is closer to where that was. This is one of the larger mosaics, probably in the living room. And if you notice, there's no animals or people. Um, they were very concerned with making sure that they didn't have any idols. They thought this mosaic might be a part of the kitchen, and this mosaic a part of the bathhouse. And uh, these were the toilets, the squatty potties. This is a public immersion pool, and right now there's a Christian group, there appears to be, um, right over here. <laughs> 